All right, hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. Today we will be hearing from Rachel and we'll be hearing on human rights at the Mental Health Review Tribunal, advising and assisting people under involuntary orders. Rachel has kindly given her time to us today. And before we get started, my name is Sam. I'm the Sector Sustainability Coordinator at Community Legal Centres Queensland. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're holding this webinar today. In Brisbane, they're the Turrbal and the Jagara people, and I would like to extend that respect to the lands all over Queensland. We pay their, our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play in our society. As this webinar is being viewed by people across Queensland and today across Australia, we'd like to pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land throughout the country and we extend a warm welcome to any First Nations Australians listening today. Today we're joined by Rachel who will be talking about the impacts and um, the ways in which we can work with people and help to assist them under involuntary orders. She's kindly giving all of her time today and will be talking to us and I'll hand over to her um, to tell us a little bit more about herself. Today's webinar is being recorded and we'll have the recording available to download later today or possibly tomorrow. The PowerPoints and other materials have been emailed out to everyone who's registered and they're also available to download from our website already and from the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel in case you didn't get the email. There's two ways that you can ask questions. You can press the button that looks like a hand and we'll see the hand go up at our end and we can unmute you so that you can ask your question via the microphone. Or the easiest method is that you can type your question into the chat box on the control panel and we'll read your question out. We will be holding questions until the end of the presentation, but feel free to type them in as you think of them. You don't need to wait until the end. I'll now hand over to Rachel and talk to you again at the end of the session. Thanks, Rach. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Sloper. Thank you for the introduction, Sam. Um, and do let me know as we go on if you have any problems um, seeing what I'm talking about or hearing me uh, in terms of technology. Uh, so I am the senior lawyer for the Law Right Community Legal Centre uh, Court and Tribunal Service at the Mental Health Review Tribunal. We used to be called uh, MHLP or Mental Health Legal Practice and we've had a few other names before um, in our uh, roughly five year existence. Um, but uh, so I'm the senior, currently the senior lawyer in charge of that service um, and uh, I uh, have been in that position for about uh, 18 months and before that um, my career has been in the private sector uh, and also working for non-profits uh, in pretty much all areas of the law associated with uh, disability, health and ageing which is the thing that I'm most interested in. Um, so. Uh, that's probably enough about me. Um, I'm really happy that there's people from across Australia attending today, um, particularly if you are listening from a jurisdiction um, such as Victoria or um, the ACT where um, you have had these sorts of questions come up for you um, several years before we have in Queensland, please give us the benefit of your experience by um, putting a comment uh, in the chat. Um, so. I won't be covering uh, everything on my slides today. <laughs> I'm trying to make my slides um, reasonably comprehensive, but I'm more interested in this being a session where uh, if there's people on, on the chat who've got more knowledge, you know, this is a very much an emerging area. And uh, I'm one of the people in Queensland, uh, very few of us who practice exclusively in this jurisdiction. Um, but I'm in no, by no means the foremost expert in Queensland, let alone Australia. So please, if you have um, something to add, particularly if there's something uh, that I'm saying that you've, you've actually tried and it didn't work very well, please let us all know. So uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, the Tribal and the Agora peoples as the First Nations owners of the land that um, I'm recording on today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. 
Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that this is a really sensitive jurisdiction and I may be discussing or describing things today that are a lived experience for you or someone you're close to, which can be painful. Um, and particularly when uh, we speak about the disproportionate struggles of First Nations people in this jurisdiction uh, later on. And I do apologise for any errors in my approach that I might make because it's not my lived experience. So, uh, as you can see in your slides, and as I hope was made clear in the advertising, uh, this will be a session with a particularly narrow focus on hearings. Um, so what happens before hearings, during hearings, after hearings. I won't be proposing to cover anything really outside the tribunal itself. The mental health law is vast. There's a lot of overlapping areas with other areas of health law, tenancy, etc. This is not a webinar about that. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to speak to uh, stick to my knitting, um, but uh, these are the things that we will be covering today. Um, and uh, in terms of the things we won't be covering, um, the Mental Health Act and Human Rights Act uh, generally is going to be a basic knowledge is going to be assumed, as was in the advertising. Um, but I do have some slides. Um, where I've put information about where to get that basic understanding if you're attending today and you kind of thought, oh, well, I really want to hear this, but <laughs> I'm not sure where to start. So have a look at those slides, um, which are this one and that one. So the first thing I wanted to say is that um, human rights are distinctly built in to the Mental Health Act 2016 in a way that's uh, unusual for uh, amongst you know, legislation as a whole. That's important to remember when we're looking at the applicability of the Human Rights Act as a new piece of law uh, because that makes the Mental Health Act different um, in but ways that are good, ways that are bad, um, when we're thinking about how we might use this act, this new act, um, to uh, make a difference for people that we're representing, or if you're listening today and you're representing yourself um, in an upcoming hearing or proceeding, also important to take into account. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, this is uh, an act which uh, has explicit reference to this idea of human rights in a way that most other legislation uh, really doesn't in Queensland. Uh, and that's partly down um, to some advocacy that took place over the um, review period for this legislation, which led, it become, led to the uh, revocation of the Mental Health Act 2000 uh, in favour of the uh, Mental Health Act 2016. So here I have, just as an example, um, we have one of the main, um, the objects of the Act uh, and talking about the way that um, that's meant to be achieved. And this is a lot more explicit than what we saw in the Mental Health Act 2000. So, uh, yeah, so that's just the, the rest of section three. And uh, the Act is also quite explicit that uh, these objects are not just nice to have things, they're to be used um, by anyone uh, who's using powers or responsibilities under the Act in the way that we think about interpreting the Act from a statutory interpretation perspective. Um, now, uh, having said that, uh, it's uh, been very difficult uh, in practice um, for those of us who appear in the tribunal and give submissions on a human rights basis, uh, alluding to these aspects of the 2016 Act has been extremely difficult to get much traction uh, on those submissions. Um, I can't speculate as to why, uh, but uh, that's one of the things that I think many of us are hoping will change uh, with the introduction of the HRA. So, the other thing to remember about the Mental Health Act specifically and its concepts of human rights uh, is that it's wider than the Human Rights Act. That is, 
it binds all persons um, with powers and responsibilities, not just government entities, which is the focus of the Human Rights Act. So I'm talking about, you know, a nominated support person, um, doctors, um, you know, there is some case for previously, whatever, if we've got an individual doctor making a treatment decision, they're not an administrative decision maker, um, which I'll be interested to see revisited, but that's a sidebar. Um, and so, whereas the Human Rights Act is very much deliberately uh, excluding private people and relationships with businesses and so forth. So the Human Rights Act, if you give given power or responsibility, um, the concepts of human rights baked into the Mental Health Act, they apply to you in what you do. So of course the downside of uh, all this is that uh, we have um, modifiers of those rights um, which are more restrictive than the modifiers in some ways in the Human Rights Act. So um, in, in terms of the least restrictive way, um, it's explicitly considering the safety of other people. And similarly, in the three objects of the Act, which are similar to the Mental Health Act 2000 objects, um, one of the differences is it's a lot more explicit that we've got the well-being of persons with mental illness given equal weighting in those objects with community safety and diversion from a criminal justice system. Um, so one of the um, useful things about the 2016 Act is it's a lot more explicit about the concepts which were latent in the 2000 Act and how they're meant to uh, be used and that's where you see the principles and the, you know, um, the uh, section three, you know, talking about how we're supposed to use this concept of um, the well-being of a person with mental illness being an object. Uh, but you still have this modifier. Uh, and that's also why, for example, it's not just principles about people with mental illness, it's principles about victims and their rights and, um, and so on. So my expectation is in some ways, uh, it may actually make it more difficult um, to achieve change at a judicial level in how the Mental Health Act is interpreted with the Human Rights Act um, compared to acts which don't contain references to human rights already. Um, and that's because, that, that's just my opinion, um, and uh, that's because there, all the existing case law that we have so far interpreting these con concepts in the 2016 Act um, from the various courts um, have already had to interpret the concepts of human rights contained in that Act. And so I think we may struggle uh, more to um, convince the court that the um, Human Rights Act 2019 um, makes a uh, significant difference um, to how that, that the Act ought to be interpreted now that it exists. And certainly um, that uh, general line of thinking um, is evident in the tribunal's own publications about it. You know, it's a policy on human rights um, talking about how the Mental Health Act is a rights respecting instrument and we had a similar report. Um, from the Queensland Mental Health Commission uh, reviewing the 2016 um, MHA and talking about, uh, well, you know, this is an act that respects human rights. So I think we may um, encounter some difficulties there at the judicial level. But um, it's still, I think, um, good for us uh, in terms of uh, what sorts of differences um, we might see there is some evidence that the uh, tribunal has taken uh, additional um, human rights issues on board in terms of conditions um, where previously we were seeing, you know, standard boilerplate conditions uh, imposed. It was very difficult to have those changed in any kind of bespoke way. Um, and uh, although it has to be said that started happening in late last year before the Human Rights Act, and I understand it was linked to a Mental health case um, being heard in the mental health court at the time rather than the Human Rights Act, but small change is good change. Um, so it's also clear to us that in our practice that the new sort of statement of reasons template in use for 2020 prompts members to explain how they've considered relevant human rights under the HRA. Um, uh, by the way, uh, the published statement of reasons are back up on the uh, mental health review tribunal website after a number of months being removed and I will be talking about a couple of the published statements of reasons later. Uh, so the um, we've seen 
we've seen that you know there, there is this idea that the tribunal is taken seriously, the idea that it has to consider it as to how it gets considered. That's the process uh, we are in. Um, so the one thing I will say about that is that um, where we didn't have guidance before for the Mental Health Act's kind of own concepts of human rights, something specific and I think probably helpful that the Human Rights Act adds is um, clearer guidance. Um, so the you know the Queensland Human Rights Commission has published uh, its own guides drawn from the Victorian case law about how public entities are to um, engage in the process of decision making um, around proper consideration of human rights. Uh, and that's, as I say, um, drawn from the Victorian case law, um, which you know our act is modelled on the Charter, and it's um, clear from that case law, uh, which so far, so far as we can <laughs> So, so far as we have case law in Queensland, which there's, there's still not a lot of it, um, as expected, the Victorian case law is being um, used as persuasive authority by the Queensland courts. And um, in, it's quite a detailed process. So it's clearer guidance than just talking about some principles. Um, uh, it's, it's, the Victorian case law makes it clear that this has really got to be a in-depth consideration, step by step, um, and uh, I don't think we're seeing that from the tribunal, at least in their published statements of reasons and the statements of reasons we're getting for our clients. We're not seeing that yet. Um, but it is more obvious that um, that's happening because it is being asked about and talked about in uh, hearings and in statements of reasons. So we have this greater transparency in terms of it's more obvious to us when that is or isn't happening. And that's a good thing. Um, so, and we also have an, an avenue for complaints under the Human Rights Act, which wasn't provided for under the Mental Health Act, which is the Commission. Um, and I'll just note uh, for those of you who might not be aware um, that uh, the Commission does have a significant weight on its complaints at the moment, at the time I'm speaking. Um, and so if anyone in the audience is from the Commission and you want to give us an update as to that, be great, but my understanding is it's roughly somewhere between six and eight weeks um, for a, um, processing um, those complaints. Uh, so, of course, the, the question, um, the threshold question has got, got to be, given that the Human Rights Act is applicable to um, public entities, well, is the tribunal a public entity? Um, so it's uh, the Human Rights Act, um, like the Charter uh, in Victoria, makes it clear that when we're looking at a court or tribunal, um, they're not considered a public entity unless they're exercising uh, administrative power. Um, and for those of you who might be listening who are not lawyers, um, or that there, there is a concept in the law, um, body of law, administrative law, which um, basically talks about different types of government power and um, plays along with the separation of powers that we have in Australia, looking at the differences between judicial power, um, parliament power, legislative power, and uh, government decision making of the executive and its agencies and administrative power. Um, and it governs uh, review of government decisions um, as they apply to individuals, that's the branch of administrative law. So this is what the, the charter and the uh, act are talking about when they talk about exercising administrative power. It's not um, you know, paperwork power, it's referring to that very specific legal concept. Um, so it's uh, obvious um, that the tribunal's exercising administrative powers in its pre-hearing and post-hearing processes, you know, it's setting down hearing dates, um, what, how people are notified of decisions, um, these sorts of things. But what we're really interested in, uh, I think, is to what, ex to what extent um, is the tribunal a public entity when it's making decisions as a panel? So the tribunal uh, acknowledges itself uh, in its policy on this question um, that it and its staff are a public entity for those administrative, pre and post, et cetera, decisions. Um, 
But what's really interesting about its policy is that um, it seems to make a distinction between members acting as a panel uh, uh, as distinct from staff, uh, making these references to uh, the fact that they're appointed by the Governor General and Council and um, the obligation of members when constituting the tribunal to interpret statutory provisions in a way that's compatible with human rights, which is a reference to um, the court and tribunal functions or the judicial functions, if you like, uh, discussed in the Act. So uh, our view and our practice is that the tribunal is exercising administrative powers when it hears reviews and applications, when it's sitting as a panel. Um, and as to why, um, well, the Court of Appeal says so. <laughs> um, so it's always nice to have some authority uh, on point for these things. Um, and this isn't actually a Human Rights Act case, but that doesn't matter for this purpose. Um, so the Court of Appeal found in a case this year, um, which uh, hasn't been officially reported yet in terms of authorised citations, um, but it found that the um, tribunal is acting administratively when it makes an examination authority. Um, and because it um, creates and confers rights and reduces rights. Um, and again, for non-lawyers, that's a, uh, a concept um, of administrative law um, that uh, if you're curious, you can read more about, um, can get very confusing. Uh, but fortunately, we have the Queensland's highest court telling us um, that the MHRT is acting administratively when it makes an authority. Um, and this is quite useful because the same reasoning can be applied to decisions about reviews of treatment authorities, forensic orders and so forth, and the making of a um, TSO um, confidentiality order, treatment authority, etc. by the tribunal and authorisation to give ECT. So when the tribunal is making a decision uh, on evidence um, that is going to uh, not just review something that has been done um, by a lower, le lower level of decision maker in a hospital, for example, um, but when it's um, deciding does this particular order um, meet the criteria we can make this or um, is this order continuing to be suitable um, given the new evidence from the last six months. So in Victoria, um, this was uh, dealt with quite early on in the charter actually. Um, so um, they have a different structure um, in the mental health jurisdiction um, to the one that we do. Uh, our tribunal does a lot more things itself rather than there being a two-tier um, review system of a board and then a tribunal, but without getting too distracted by that. Um, yeah, the, the Victorian um, decision makers, and this is actually um, the one judge uh, in this case where he was um, sitting on BCAT and then uh, sitting as the Supreme Court, um, were very clear um, after some considerable discussion that uh, when a tribunal is making these orders, um, and uh, it, it is acting administratively. Uh, and that means that it's, um, it's a public entity. Um, so the same reason can be applied uh, to appeals. Um, so it's this, um, I'm sorry, I've just gone too far. Yeah, so um, in Victoria, we have these cases about, um, and we also have the same uh, line of authority for this idea of um, appeals from the Office of the Chief Psychiatrist or Hospital Administrative Decisions, which are much less common uh, matters for the tribunal to be hearing, um, but uh, useful uh, all the same. Um, so QCAT uh, in Queensland has the, by far the bulk of decisions so far that have been published on the Human Rights Act. Um, because of the sorts of things it deals with um, and the fact that uh, our tribunal and court don't really publish um, quite to the same extent as QCAT does. Um, but QCAT has directly adopted the Victorian test in deciding about whether it makes um, administrative decisions or judicial decisions for the purposes of the Human Rights Act. 
Um, and that means, um, in our view, uh, that we've got uh, the Mental Health Review Tribunal acting as a public entity for what decisions it makes before, after and during a hearing, as well as during uh, the decision um, for a hearing itself. And those things uh, must be compatible with the Human Rights Act. Um, if you're curious about that Queensland Court of Appeal decision, by the way, um, there's a great discussion by Dr Sam Boyle from PUT in the September issue of the Queensland Law Society magazine, Proctor, um, which you can find pretty easily on the internet. And as far as I'm aware, there's an appeal for that. Um, so um, usefully as well, what does it mean for a public entity to make a proper consideration of human rights. We also have some early authority on that now from the Queensland Supreme Court, um, just September, actually. So um, if this webinar had gone ahead when it was originally scheduled, I may not have been able to tell you that. Um, so uh, we've, we've got some guidance on that as well. Um, so I just want to note before I move on that um, there was um, there was a quite a lot of discussion in that early Victorian law about, well, you know, given that the tribunal has to um, interpret the law and things like that, um, well, isn't this, this quasi-judicial tribunal? Um, shouldn't, you know, we consider it a, a judicial um, decision when it makes a decision and, you know, exclude it from the act for that reason? Um, and what um, Justice Bell, who was the decision maker in those cases, said about that was, um, a administrative decision made by a decision maker who is required to act judicially remains administrative in character. Um, so that is what he means by that is that uh, just because um, you are an administrative body for the purposes of administrative law, the fact that you have to exercise some um, judicial decision making power from time to time in the course of your job um, doesn't magically transform you. Um, when you're doing that into something that's not an administrative body. Uh, so um, the uh, other, so getting back to Innocent uh, Electoral Commission, so this was a case recently about, um, uh, from memory, the Britain City Council election um, and uh, access to ballots um, for that. Um, and uh, uh, Justice Ryan um, didn't think a great deal of the submissions that were made, but took the time to make um, a, a reasonable amount of commentary about uh, the Human Rights Act and how it did apply um, on, I think he said, a generous view of the submissions of the applicant. Um, so, Yes, in terms of, uh, sorry, I encourage you to have a look at that case um, for this purpose if you want to step it out more. But the short version is um, he cited the PJB and Melbourne Health case, which is um, kind of the source of, uh, as I understand it, the Human, uh, Queensland Human Rights Commission's guidance to public entities. And it's quite long settled, heavily cited. Um, about what that process looks like when we have to consider um, human rights. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's also a range of really useful comments from Justice Bell in um, that case about other things um, like, uh, you know, how you consider the scope um, of a human right when you think it applies and how do you tell um, and, and things like that. So well worth reading, even if you don't, you're not aware. Uh, just a word on COVID-19, uh, the inescapable. Um, uh, so as you will, um, as you will have um, experienced yourself, um, we've seen a bunch of limits. So, for example, we've seen, oh, well, people can't come to the community health centre, we won't do a home visit, and there have been severe restrictions on access to hearings as a result for people who um, don't have a phone or a computer. Um, we had some problems early with 
uh, no, you can't come to a hospital because you can as a visitor, not a lawyer. Fortunately, our law society sorted of that one out. Um, and the other thing we saw was um, training teams not organising travel because of COVID. Um, so that meant a lot of people couldn't use their leave, um, even when it was demonstrably connected to their right to family and freedom of movement, but also part of their transition plan um, and linked to, to risk. So um, just a word on uh, some legislation around that. Um, so uh, obviously, you know, as things calm down in Queensland and um, around the country for now, um, we have those those restrictions are being wound back, um, and we haven't been seeing as much of them. But you know, there's always scope for this thing to, these things to ramp back up again. In which case, the Human Rights Act is a really important tool. Um, but also, when you're talking to to treating teams and the tribunal themselves, so I won't go into that too much. But in terms of the tribunal, with our Emergency Response Act, and there's similar acts all over the country, um, it empowers uh, a range of government decision makers basically to decide that certain statutory time, time limits won't apply to themselves in the purpose of government administration. Um, so, for example, you know, um, if the Act, like the Mental Health Act, provides for a period where and it, um, it's meant to do something, like hear a proceeding, give notice, make a decision, give reasons, um, it can be modified. Uh, on the grounds that the modification is necessary for public health or, um, and there's more grounds in the Act itself. Um, but this has to be done by notice to the parties um, and interestingly it can be modified by the tribunal on its own initiative or also on application of a party to the proceeding. Um, so I haven't seen this used by the tribunal um, in the current environment and given things are slowing down a little, I wouldn't expect necessarily to see it used, um, but just to bring it to your attention that it is there. Um, and particularly that uh, the parties to the proceedings can also ask the tribunal um, to, to use this. Uh, and you might like to do that if it was um, justified on you know, COVID related disruptions to usual uh, access to interpreters or access to community health centres and so forth in a way that was really affecting you or your client. Um, so uh, there are, um, it's clear that it also uh, affects measurement of something what, what is defined as a reasonable time for doing something. Um, and the other thing is it can't be done um, as a blanket rule applying to all kinds of proceedings unless there's a regulation. There hasn't been such a regulation. So this is really a case by case kind of thing. Um, it does expire uh, at the end of this year. Um, if we were to see a second wave in Queensland, I would expect to see this sort of thing revived, um, but it does expire at the end of the year. And the, po the policy from the tribunal um, on how it plans to use this, if at all, is quite narrow. Um, so if you are uh, facing this or interested in using it, definitely have a read of their policy before uh, asking. Um, so, uh, yes, okay. Um, so let's talk about some specifics. So what does it mean um, in practice to have these options available to us under the Human Rights Act um, to a public entity like uh, decisions um, of the tribunal? Um, what sorts of decisions and uh, things that it does might we be interested in um, using the Human Rights Act for in advocacy? Um, so I'm going to go through this in the way that um, hearing does, so before, during, decision, after um, is the general structure. Um, and before I do this, just an alert for any uh, lawyers who practice in traditional litigation or uh, more traditional courts who might be interested in this work or do a bit of this work. Um, 
just be prepared uh, that there's not a lot of um, procedural rules in the tribunal that you might be used to. Um, so for example, you can't choose your hearing date. If you're busy on that day, too bad. Um, and the most, probably one of the more important things to know is there's no procedure for adjournments in advance, um, which uh, is yeah, sometimes a surprise to some people. Um, so decisions that we might see beforehand that we're interested in looking at human rights applications for. So um, if we've got an applicant review on foot and um, we've got a decision whether to grant or refuse it, um, and a lot of things, to be honest, about how a hearing is set down. So given that there's that very limited flexibility um, after a hearing day is set down, uh, it's probably most practical to try and ask for these things when you know a hearing date is likely to be set but hasn't been set yet, uh, because it's quite difficult to get these things changed once a hearing date has been set down. Uh, you might find um, that if it's too late for that, it, you might be um, more strategically better off trying to go for an adjournment and um, have these things set up uh, for the next um, hearing date. So I'll a bit about adjournments later. So when you really break it down, there are a lot of decisions that the tribunal can make at the registry level um, about uh, who, what, when, where, why that really affect um, a lot of clients uh, in a way that we might want to use um, advocacy to change if it's going to have a um, profound impact on our client's ability, for example, to participate in the hearing. So we've got location, um, and as you, if you practice regularly, you'll know we've got Queensland Health locations only, and that often controls physically the number of support persons that can fit into a room. So other than one support person, additional support persons are at the discretion of the panel on the day. And if you've got a small room, um, then, and particularly in a COVID environment, you're going to have a hard time um, convincing a panel that uh, no, we really need not just um, you know my parent one, but perhaps parent two, or um, you know friend and grandmother, or um, for culturally and linguistically diverse communities, there might be quite a number of people who are appropriate to attend as support persons rather than a single person, um, and so location choice. Uh, does control that as well. Um, similarly, if you've got a client who uh, doesn't have easy access to a car um, and also doesn't have easy access to a telephone, um, if you're looking, unless someone in the trading team um, and the client's comfortable with that is going to bring them to the hearing location or um, is going to provide them with a telephone uh, to attend the hearing by phone, um, a location that's far from someone's house um, or compared to perhaps some of the other choices of location available in that area, so you know, hospital versus community clinic, um, might also control a person's ability to get to the hearing. Um, we also see a lot of clashes with um, criminal court dates uh, that uh, were you know, discussed, can, can be discussed with the tribunal or the tribunal was aware of um, at the previous hearing and that hasn't been taken into account. And also time of day, so you know where we've got um, someone and you, you, you're on medication where either you're awake in the morning or you're awake in the evening, but um, your hearings keep getting scheduled at the time when you're asleep. Um, so in terms of those things, um, we've also got decisions like um, structure of notices and self-report forms. Um, where people who don't read written English well or write written English well um, might have trouble with that. Um, the, the website with all the application forms is in English only. Um, there are some translated fact sheets, but they're limited. Um, and this is a personal view of my, of my own, but um, my view is that the current self-report form doesn't guide patients to put in information that the tribunal puts the most weight on uh, in a hearing. Um, similarly, how long a, uh, a hearing is set down for uh, can materially influence um, how you know submissions go and how much evidence 
you as an advocate or you as the person representing yourself are able to get out um, at the hearing. So if you've got a treatment authority and it's 30 minutes long, um, often uh, you will find that uh, submissions on what the tribunal can do if you're uh, appearing as an advocate or a lawyer and the tribunal has already heard from um, the person themselves, you might find yourself with five minutes at the end or less than that. Um, and that might not be suitable um, to run uh, a proper argument about revoking a treatment authority. Uh, and similarly for longer hearings, if you've got a lot of parties or a lot of evidence to get through a lot of contentious matters. So, um, you know, it uh, can be worth making an argument for a longer hearing time, but you're going to have to provide uh, a justification of um, why the tribunal uh, ought to um, consider this as um, something that's not just uh, a procedural matter that kind of just gets scheduled and moved on from. And in that respect, um, the Human Rights Act uh, gives us some options. So, um, the, so the um, tribunal is a public entity when it make, is making these decisions. Um, there's no uh, set formula. Um, case law is pretty clear about that, but they involve um, a decision maker seriously turning their mind to the human rights impact of what is proposed uh, and uh, making a decision uh, about um, whether uh, its um, limitations are limitations that you're seeking to impose are proportionate and reasonable or not. Um, so all of these things that I've just talked about. Um, there's not really um, the limitations involved in them aren't really required by another law, which is one of the Section 58 reasons why you might um, not have to do on what an advocate is asking for. Um, and it's also clear that uh, from, the, from the Victorian case law, um, which we haven't, we haven't seen apply in full in Queensland yet, but uh, um, the cases we do have at a um, superior court level make it clear that they're considering it persuasive to date. Um, the scope of rights is to be interpreted generously and widely um, before considering when you consider a uh, whether it's being engaged in a particular decision or not. And then um, so, you know, it's something that um, it isn't just on the face of, you know, the words written in the written uh, on the face of the document necessarily or the dictionary meaning. Um, it's about um, the full scope of, of what um, that is meant to be about. So as an example of that, uh, where, you know, the, the Melbourne Health, um, so the Patrick's case was about, in, in essence, uh, the right to, to home um, and, and family and property. And uh, Justice Bell went on at some length <laughs> Uh, to talk about how this wasn't just a narrow idea of, you know, a house or certain legal property rights. Uh, it was about functioning as a human being with full dignity um, and being able to flourish in the private sphere uh, and the privacy of your home um, and all these sort of, all these sort of um, personal and relational and in spiritual dimensions. Uh, so, there's, it's, it's not just uh, limited to, uh, oh, well, you know, I don't think this person is being humiliated, so it's not cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment. Um, so I will say that so far, and I'll bring this up again later when we get there, but I will say so far the statements of reasons published by the tribunal demonstrate that so far the tribunal is perhaps not um, considering at a decision making level the true expansiveness of the scope of rights and as to when which rights are engaged. Um, and so we may need to do some talking and writing um, to show them uh, and convince the relevant decision maker that this is a right which is engaged and they are obliged to um, consider it in a detailed way. Um, so, for an example, with some of these decisions that I'm talking about now, um, 
uh, you know, we, you're primarily looking at um, right to a fair hearing, even at this stage. Um, and uh, if uh, someone's um, ability to access community treatment, for example, is at stake, um, you might uh, also be looking at a right to health services. Uh, I'm realising that I'm getting far too excited and taking too long to talk about some of these things, so I'll just move on. So these are some of the uh, aspects that you're going to be wanting to consider during a, a hearing as well. Um, so I just want to move on to some of these statements and reasons that I've been alluding to. So. Um, it's really useful to go and have a look at all these because at the end where they talk about the human rights impacts, um, it's clear that there are a range of rights which the tribunal are regularly considering during a hearing um, and you know, making commentary about whether they apply or not. Now, of course, statement of reasons, published ones are not binding on the subsequent tribunal, but they're an interesting collective view at how the tribunal is thinking. So in section 31, um, and you know, in one statement of reasons, this isn't, there was a the view that it wasn't limited because the person had a lawyer and they attended. Um, and then, you know, we have this converse uh, view in a different statement of reasons that the hearing isn't public and acknowledging that's a limitation, but it's justified because if you made it public, it would limit um, the rights of the Section 25 to privacy. But uh, what's really interesting to me about this one is that um, the person didn't attend, uh, but we didn't have a limitation on a right to a fair hearing because they were given a lawyer and they were given the right to participate. And as you will know, uh, sometimes uh, people, the idea of choosing not to attend uh, can be a bit vexed with some people if the option for them to attend at that pre-hearing stage wasn't properly ventilated in terms of how difficult it might be for them to attend a hearing. Um, so decisions in the hearing itself um, are all these sorts of things and I would count adjournment as one of them but also the evidentiary decisions um, and when we're looking at the conditions that are uh, allocated on an order which is often the only thing you can change. Um, you'll know if you appear in this jurisdiction regularly there's a very high standard of proof uh, that's required in terms of medical evidence um, for something like an alcohol condition um, and uh, maintaining, uh, you know, don't use drugs conditions uh, when those things are already illegal uh, or driving conditions um, and a limited range of customization. And I think uh, conditions are where we perhaps have the most power um, to and scope to use uh, arguments um, about you know, equality before the law, um, particularly in terms of discrimination. Um, so just because this act is uh, designed to be, um, you know, like like uh, just spell talks about in crack, uh, this act is designed to see um, people's rights restricted deliberately um, because of uh, mental health reasons. Um, that doesn't mean uh, necessarily that in all cases and everything um, that's covered by the Act that the limits are justified and that you don't have an impact on something like um, discrimination. So specific rights that the Tribunal has referred to, again I've listed in the presentation and sorry it was Patrick's case not crack but um, this, this issue of discrimination in the Act. Um, uh, the freedom of movement one with the um, approved address condition, I'm really interested to see if there can be any change about that uh, because I've never had any luck getting any change of um, residence condition. Um, but what's interesting I think is how differently different panels have interpreted this um, where they've considered that it, um, it was limited and it wasn't limited uh, and whether that was proportionate or not. Um, I tend to agree with <laughs> the second one uh, in terms of it does limit the right and then the real discussion is whether it's reasonable and proportionate which is where I think we have more um, possibility for uh, doing something about it. 
Uh, another really interesting one um, is uh, statement of reasons uh, about um, limits on cultural rights being justified because of the risk to this woman's children and their right to protection under Section 26. Uh, and that's something that comes up a lot um, for First Nations men and women who have had their children um, removed from their care in a child safety context um, or a child under a TA who also um, has that going on for them. So uh, in terms of, I have a couple of slides here about um, how the um, interpretation of the Mental Health Act might change under the Human Rights Act. As I said earlier, I don't think we're going to see a lot of movement in that easily. Uh, but some of the areas I think we might have potential to, to see movement there are some of these more broader, broad concepts which can be very difficult to argue about. Um, at the tribunal. Um, now, I'll just say that um, in published statement of reasons number 37, um, the Attorney General in that case cited Negro and that's N I G R O uh, and Secretary of the Department of Justice as the authority for the idea that the Human Rights Act didn't modify how the tribunal should be interpreting its obligation to balance risk to the community and benefit to the patient. So the idea of necessary to protect um, and particularly the concept and issue was unacceptable risk. Now, um, I mention it because it's the only citation uh, I've seen or heard of so far, um, but personally, I'm not sure it really advances the case much um, from the Attorney General's perspective because when you go and have a look at that case, um, it's, it's about uh, dangerous sex offenders legislation. And uh, if anything, in my view, it seems to reinforce that where there's ambiguity, it should be interpreted in favour of a person's rights. Because um, I don't think anyone's seriously suggesting that the Human Rights Act will require abandoning basic, basic um, statutory construction. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have a look at that one uh, as well. Um, and we also have um, in Innocent Electoral Commission um, Justice Ryan confirming basically that if statutory construction helps you understand the concept, um, then you, you don't get to go with the Human Rights Act to expand the obvious um, interpretation. So I've also got some suggestions here about how we might raise these things in legal argument during, for use during a hearing. Um, and I will say, uh, so far where we've gotten any traction at all on these things, it's been in writing so that um, the legal officers at the tribunal can assist the panel um, in deciding whether this is an argument worth engaging in. Um, it's not something you want to leave until the day of. Uh, so, yeah, um, not just. Just deciding what the best use of our remaining time is. I might, let's go for some questions. Does anyone have any questions? I've got one here, Rach, if you don't mind. Thank you so much for this. It's been amazing. I know I'm certainly learning a lot. Um, I've got one here from Holly. And Holly has said, um, you mentioned that the Court of Appeal has said that Human Rights Act is applicable to the MHRT's making of examination authorities because the court views that as acting administratively. Is the Mental Health Court also bound by the Human Rights Act in this way or is its exercise of powers in relation to fitness matters and forensic orders considered to still be inherently within the jurisdiction of the court as a court. Yeah, okay, so um, so firstly, I, I'm sorry if um, I've, within my communication, I've given you the wrong impression. That case is not a Human Rights Act case. So it's a case about um, examination authorities and the extent of the Judicial Review Act, but it is not a case about the Human Rights Act. But uh, the reason I'm um, citing it to you is because 
it helps us anyway with the Human Rights Act question of administrative versus judicial power because it talks, it makes it clear that the court's view is that in a different context, not to do with the Human Rights Act, um, the tribunal is exercising administrative power um, rather than judicial power when it uh, makes a decision about an examination authority. So that's why I was citing that case. So it doesn't have any direct application of the Human Rights Act in the case itself. It's just that it's um, useful analogous authority. Um, so in terms of the court um, itself, the mental health court, I would be extremely surprised uh, if um, it wasn't. So we, there's a body of administrative law about this um, that's really not so much to do with the Human Rights Act itself, but administrative law more generally. I am not an expert in administrative law. I find it deeply confusing personally. Um, but from the Victorian case law, we do see that uh, and um, Justice, actually Innes and uh, Electoral Commission um, talks about this, um, Justice Ryan talks about this in terms of when do we see a court exercising, which would usually be purely judicial, exercising administrative um, power. So I encourage you to go and read that case, but basically Justice Ryan favours um, what he calls the intermediate construction um, of, uh, which was comes out of the Victorian case law, um, which is, yes, there are some times where the court, even though it's a court, um, will be acting administratively, uh, but that's not most of the time, and that case talks about when some of those times would be. That's perfect. Thank you, Rachel. I think we've just got a couple more coming through, if that's okay. Stay in the line if you yeah. can, Rach. Thanks so much. Why? I'm, I'm free. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Thank you so much. Irene has said, why do you think that there are not enough printed materials being translated in different languages mm -hmm. to help the consumers? Um, I really can't speculate. Um, I, I really couldn't say why that decision has been made or that decision hasn't been made deliberately. Um, most of the time, uh, in general, when you see public agencies doing or not doing things, there's a budget restriction, um, and that may not be su sufficient as a limitation um, uh, reason um, for someone's human rights. Um, translation work is very expensive, uh, but yeah, I really couldn't say whether that's been a deliberate internal decision by the tribunal or whether there's some other reason. Um, and uh, yeah, certainly it's it's a concern. Um, sorry, I, I really can't say too much more about that. Yeah, that's okay. I think this is an area where there's multiple layers of multiple complexities, and unfortunately, there are uh, people who just get caught in the crossfires, and it makes it even more difficult for them. I think we've done a pretty good job of answering most of the questions that were quite content related. Um, Rachel, are you available um, if any others come through to us at CLCQ? I might, if that's okay, flick them through to you if it's not something that we can answer. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yep. Excellent. Um, we do have time for a couple more questions um, if anybody wants to send some through. Quickly, um, I think we've got one more from Holly. Um, Rachel, what is the biggest issue in your opinion in terms of equality before the law for people before who come before the MHRT? So it's hard to pick one. Um, <laughs> So I would say probably it's probably for that. In my personal opinion, it's probably everything to do with evidence. So what I mean by that is um, the act is the Mental Health Act is clear that just because you have, for example, um, you use drugs or you have certain spiritual beliefs or whatever, that that's not evidence of a mental illness. Um, but uh, and. and but then on the other hand, you know, for example, uh, in the Mental Health Review Tribunal Complaints Policy, there's a notation that if 
uh, someone is abusive or uh, unreasonable or vexatious, um, then the tribunal doesn't have to accept their complaint. And I think that encapsulates quite neatly what the core issue is in this jurisdiction. Um, by its very nature, it's a jurisdiction where people will struggle to self-represent or even to acquire sufficient evidence or instruct their lawyers to, to get it, etc. Um, where where you know that they're dealing with um, either symptoms of things that uh, could be a mental illness or uh, or um, could be something else, for example, and trying to uh, have that perspective and um, those those things about a person not influence the way that um, evidence is heard or um, you know. Uh, the way that they present at a tribunal hearing, um, I think there's a long way to go there uh, because um, this is a therapeutic jurisdiction, um, but there can be a lot of problems with, um, yeah, uh, having having people's views not heard or not taken seriously because they're not presenting in a traditional way, uh, and where that's juxtaposed with highly technical evidence from um, psychiatrists and other medical people uh, or the you know and highly technical stuff from the attorney general um, yeah I think we could do a lot more uh, to deliberately have that playing field leveled a bit more yeah absolutely well Rachel I can't see any others coming through at the moment so I would um, just like to Thank you so much for all of your knowledge um, and for answering all of our questions and for all of your time, of course. If anybody has any questions, feel free to send them through to us at a later point. Don't feel like this is your only reference and we can send those on and get you some answers if you'd like. All of the materials will be available as well as the recording in the next um, day or two. I am going to stop the recording now. Thank you so much for everybody for joining. Thank you once again, Rachel for giving us your time and we will speak to you soon. Thank you. Thanks guys.